Good evening, and welcome to Kenneth Cox's Dimensions of Prophecy. I'm Brenda Wood. Has anyone ever attempted to explain the reason for some dilemma by saying to you, it was just God's will? Perhaps you found yourself in a situation where a mother has just lost a child in some tragic accident. At the funeral, you overhear someone explain, it was God's will. Was it really? How can you and I know just what God's will is? Have you ever said to yourself, I wish I knew what the Lord wants me to do? Tonight, Pastor Cox is dealing with the most important question, how to know God's will for your life. I promise you'll learn how to find the answers to questions that have everything to do with your happiness and peace of mind. Let's join Pastor Kenneth Cox and his Dimensions of Prophecy team for tonight's exciting presentation, How to Know God's Will. How do you see yourself? Often we see ourselves through the eyes of other people. There's a trick that the Lord would like for us to learn, and it's not really a trick, but a message. To see ourselves through someone else's eyes. Oh uh -huh. 
Have you ever had somebody come over to your house and say, uh, go to town with me or go somewhere with me, and you said, well, if the Lord's willing? Just exactly what do you mean? When you say, well, this is the Lord's will, how can I know that it's God's will? Tonight, we want to take a look at the subject of the will of God. How to know God's will. How can I know God's will for my life as an individual? How can I know that? Many, many people would like to know what the Lord wants them to do. Have so many people say, well, if I just knew what God wanted me to do. And I see a, and hear a great number of people that use the phrase, it's the will of God. Let me give you an illustration. Let's say that there's a doctor. His, uh, his wife is sick. She has a very serious uh, disease. He takes her to the very best medical help in the world. They treat her with the very latest medicine. They do everything that medical science can do to heal her. But in spite of everything they do, the doctor's wife dies. And at the funeral service, somebody says to him, well, it was just the Lord's will. You mean all this time and all the money that this doctor has spent on trying to cure his wife all this time he was fighting the will of God? Is that what's happening here? Just, just what do we mean when we say it's the will of God? And as I mentioned last night, here is a mother who has just lost her baby. And they're having a funeral service and somebody says to that young mother, it's the will of God. Is that God's will? I want you to listen to a text with me. Matthew 18, verse 14. Even so, it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. No, that's not God's will. So we need to understand clearly, and we're going to spend a little time tonight establishing what we mean when we say it's the will of God. We're going to look at the will of God just for a few minutes, and then we're going to take a look and see how you and I can know God's will for our life. That's what we're going to do. To begin with, I would like to say that you have to look at the will of God in basically three aspects. You've got to look at the will of God in the sense of the intentional will of God. What was the intentional will of God? For instance, let's take in the case of his son, Jesus Christ. If you pick up the Bible and you read it, it was God's intentional will. Follow me carefully tonight. Very carefully. If you read the scripture, it was God's intentional will that his son come to this earth. That was his intentional will. It was God's intentional will that his son die in order that you and I might be saved. That was God's intentional will. Because as I have told you all along, there could not be any salvation without the shedding of blood. And therefore, his son must come and die. That was God's intentional will. It was God's intentional will that the Jewish people were to accept his son that they were to become God's ambassadors to the whole world. That was God's intentional will, that through the Jewish people, he would, they were to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. That was God's intentional will. But he came, but the Jewish people didn't accept him. They rejected him. Listen to what the scripture says about it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her, her chicks under her wings, 
and you were not willing. Now, that was not what they wanted to do. They went against the intentional will of God. They were not willing to go along with it. And because they were not willing, you find certain things begin to change. Now, you're going to have to follow me very carefully at this point or you'll misunderstand me. And I don't want you misunderstanding me. You see, it was God's intentional will that his son come to this earth, that his son die for your sins and mine. But it was not God's intentional will that his son die by crucifixion. Now I stirred up your pure mind, didn't I? No, it wasn't God's intentional will that Jesus died by crucifixion. Notice what it says here in the book of Isaiah. He was posed and he was afflicted, or oppressed, he was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. You see, the scripture talks about Jesus dying as the lamb. We talked about it last night, didn't we? Night before. You find example after example through the word of God that Jesus was to die, die like the lamb. You remember a man by the name of Abraham? And God told Abraham, take your son, Abraham, and take him up to Mount Moriah and there offer him as a sacrifice unto me. He was to place that son on the altar now, when Abraham took that son, Isaac, up there and was ready to offer him, who do you think that typified? Yes, it typified Jesus Christ. That's what it represented. And Abraham got his son up there, and here he's about ready to take the life of his son when an angel comes and stays his hand and says that there is a ram over there in the thicket and to offer that ram. By the way, I don't have time to go in into it tonight. But where Abraham offered Isaac or was going to offer Isaac, that's the exact place that the Jewish people believed that the altar of sacrifice in the temple was. You see, the temple's built on Mount Moriah. I believe it's the same place. And so you find all the offering of the lamb down through the ages after they took that lamb and offered it, it pointed to the Messiah the day he would come. It also represented the way he would die. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying he didn't have to die. He had to die, folks. But he didn't necessarily have to die by crucifixion. But instead of them accepting him, they rejected him. They refused to accept him. And you find, because of that, that brings us to what we're going to call tonight the circumstantial will of God. God's intention. God's plan was his son would come, that he would die, that the Jewish people would accept him, that they would accept him as the Messiah, and they would take the message of God's love to the whole world. That was God's intention. But instead of doing that, they rejected Jesus Christ. Now, since they have rejected him, that brings us to the circumstantial will of God. All right. Matthew 26, verse 39, he went a little farther, fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as, what? I will, but as you will. Christ, under those circumstances, 
the fact that they have rejected him, he can see the cross coming. He can see that they're going to crucify him. He understands where it's going, and he says, Father, not my will, but your will. Under those circumstances, it now becomes the Father's will that Jesus die by crucifixion. The circumstantial will of God. They rejected him. And so he's going to let his son die on the cross. They take him to Pilate's judgment hall. He's tried. And the people yell, crucify him. Crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And he's taken out to Golgotha. And they crucify the Son of God. That's the circumstantial will of God that he die that way. Wasn't God's intention, but under those circumstances, he said yes, and so his son is taken out there and he's crucified, and that brings us to what we're going to call the ultimate will of God. Now, you see, God's intention was that he come, son come here, that he be accepted by the Jewish people, that they would become God's representatives to the whole earth, that they would spread the gospel to the whole world. That was his intentions, that his son would die. Not necessarily by crucifixion, and don't mix it up, friends. Just because it was not his intention that Christ died by crucifixion doesn't mean that he couldn't see that it was going to happen. I mean, he could see what was going to happen, but he certainly didn't tell them they had to do that. But since they rejected him, didn't accept him, under those circumstances now, it becomes the Father's will that he die by crucifixion. Now, what was the purpose? What was the purpose in God sending his son to save you and me, right? That was God's purpose. Therefore, you, listen carefully, you or anyone else, myself included, we can defeat the intentional will of God. You see, it's God's intentional will that every last one of you here in this room be saved. That lies within your hands to defeat that if you want to. That's within your hands. But one thing that cannot be defeated is the ultimate will of God. See, God's ultimate will was that mankind be saved. They rejected him, but he died on the cross and he secured your salvation and mine. God's ultimate will was carried out, and that's why it says here in Job 42, 2, I know that you can do everything and that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. God's ultimate will will be carried out. So when you and I are saying, well, that's the will of God, we need to take a close look whether we're talking about the intentional will or whether we're talking about the circumstantial will or whether we're talking about the ultimate will of God. Now, let's take some time to look at how you and I can know God's will for our lives. How does God show us his will? In the book of James, it has this to say. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. You see, I definitely must place myself within the will of God, and as I do that, God will show me his will. How does God show us his will? I'm going to share some ways that God shows his will to you. 
One thing you're going to have to do if you're going to know God's will for your life, friend, you're going to have to have a relationship with him. Can't know God's will for your life if you don't have a relationship with him. I find people that accept the Lord Jesus Christ and they never spend any time talking to him. They never spend any, t spend any time reading his word. There's no relationship there, and yet they want to know God's will for their life. Won't happen. If you're not spending any time with him, you won't know his will for your life. It says this clearly. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. To the natural man who doesn't know Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, I can tell you a lot of the things that Christian people do are foolishness to him. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't believe it. He doesn't see any sense in it. But to the person who has a relationship with Jesus Christ, different story altogether. For instance, sometimes when someone dies, I can think of a number of cases where people have called me up and asked me if I would have the funeral service, and I've gone over and visited with the family. And as we are making the funeral arrangements, one of the family will speak up and say that the person who had died would like to have this in the service. And I've said to them, how do you know that? And they say, well, because I knew them. You see, they had a relationship. They knew that person. They knew what they liked. There was a relationship there. And so if you and I are going to know God's will for our life, you're going to have to have a relationship, friend. It's necessary. It's required. Christ had that kind of relationship with his father. Now, I want to tell you something. No preacher, put this down in your little black book. Don't forget it. No preacher, no doctor, no teacher, no psychiatrist, no psychologist, can tell you God's will for your life. That is strictly a personal thing. Totally. Now, you may have a good preacher, you may have a good minister, you may have good Christian friends, and they may give you some good advice, but they cannot tell you God's will for your life. Can't do that. That has to be between you and the Lord. That's what it says here. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him, and he with me. That is a personal relationship between you and the Lord Jesus Christ. And for you to know his will, you must develop that relationship. He had that kind of relationship with his father. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you, Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. See, he had a relationship with his father where he said, from all I can see, I don't see anything out there except a trial. I don't see anything out there except a cross. I don't see anything out there but death. I don't see anything out there but separation. But, Father, I trust you. Not what I will, but what you will. So to the Christian, if you're going to know God's will for your life, I must put my life in his hands. That's required. That's why it says here in Romans 8, 28, we know that how much? All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, I want to get something real clear tonight. I run on a lot of people that don't trust the Lord. I'm talking about Christian people. I'm not talking about people that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about people out in the world. I'm talking about people that are in churches who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ that don't trust him. I have people say, well, Brother Cox, if I would do that, what would happen to me? 
Now, I want to tell you, and I want you to get it real clear tonight, the will of God for you is never unpleasant, unhappy, or evil. Never. Just decide that once and for eternity that God doesn't will bad things on you. Well, I have people that seem to think that the Lord takes pleasure in tormenting them. He just doesn't do that. God's will for you is not unpleasant. It's not evil. It's not unhappy. God's will for you is love, joy, peace. That's God's will. I can tell you right now, you don't read anything about it being bad in the fruits of the Spirit, do you? No, the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness. Those are good things, not bad things. You can safely, safely place your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. That you can do. I've seen people come right to the very point of decision. In meetings, I've talked to them and I've seen them come right to the point of turning their life over to Jesus Christ and they said, but Brother Cox, if I would do that, what's going to happen to my family? I have some teenage children and they haven't accepted the Lord and they think I'm crazy. And I've had them say, Brother Cox, if I accept the Lord, I'm going to lose my job. And they, they worry about this and, and finally I've seen them make a decision to do it, not do it, to go against the Lord. And ten years later, I'd see those people and they'd say to me, I wish that back then I had done what I should have. It didn't help them one bit not making that decision. In fact, they were worse off than if they had made the decision. The Lord Jesus Christ is not going to do anything, dear friend, but bless you. That he is going to do. And so I hope that as you consider God's will settle in your mind, it's something that you can trust, something that you can put your, your confidence in. It's something that you can enjoy. God loves you. No other way. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. What is all these things? Have you ever read it? What is all these things? Do you know? Well, read it in Matthew, the sixth chapter. It's food, it's shelter, it's clothing. That's what he's talking about. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and I'll add all these things to you. So, I'm pleading with you tonight. If you want to know God's will for your life, have a relationship with him. It'll make all the difference in the world. Now, another way that we know God's will for our life is through this book. See, that's what he put it. It's letters. It's God's message to you and I, and I need to get the book out, and I need to spend some time in it. I need to read it. You know, I can't be like the old boy that his way of reading God's Word was that each morning he got up and he let it fall open, and the first text his eyes fell upon, that was his inspiration for the day. So he got up this morning and took his Bible, and it fell open, and the first text his eyes fell on said, Judas went and hung himself. You know, and that just wasn't too inspiring. And so he closed it up and let it fall open again, and the next text he read said, Go do thou likewise. <laughs> now, what I'm, what I'm trying to tell you tonight is that's not the way to spend time in God's Word. I need to get into the book and study it and read it and find out what it's talking about. Your Word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Dear friend, if you're going to know God's will, you're going to have to spend some time in the book. You can't ignore the book. You've got to take it off the shelf. You've got to get it out of the closet. You've got to get it out of the cedar chest. You're going to have to spend some time in it. You're going to have to make some time for it. As you read the book, God's will for you will become very clear. You ever read in Scripture about this young king, Josiah? Josiah's father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather were all kings of Israel and they were terrible. I mean, they were a sorry lot. 
They didn't follow the Lord. They went contrary to the Lord. And I don't know what happened, but his, Josiah's father died when he was nine years old, and he was the heir to the throne, and they made him the king, nine years old. But for some reason, this boy's heart was tender. And he, he loved the Lord. His father and grandfather and all of them had been so bad that they had destroyed the scrolls, the writing of Scripture. They had nailed up the sanctuary. There was no priest around. It was a terrible situation. And he got some of the priests back. And one day, one of the priests was digging around in the ruins of the sanctuary, and he found the scroll. And he brought it in to Josiah and read it to him. And as he was reading the scroll to him, that young king understood exactly what God wanted him to do because this is what it says. 2 Chronicles 34, 33, Thus Josiah removed all the abominations from all the country that belonged to the children of Israel, made all who were present in Israel diligently serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not depart from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. I mean, he understood as they read that scroll to him that having those idols out there in the land and worshiping those idols needed to be done away with, and he got rid of them, and they turned back to God. You see, he understood God's will as he read the word. As you and I read the Scripture, you'll find that it will help us. It will give us spiritual discernment. You understand what I mean when I say it'll give you spiritual discernment? Huh? How many of you here tonight have ever read the story of David and Goliath? Huh? Yeah, all of you. Some of you have read it numbers of times. You remember... David's about 17 years old. He's gone to take some food to his brothers. They're on one mountainside, the camp of the Philistines over on the other side, and every day this giant Goliath comes out and challenges them to fight him. You know how tall Goliath was? Huh? Well, he's 10 foot 3 inches tall. And he challenges him, and David don't understand why somebody doesn't go out there and fight him. And his brothers think, wish this young brass boy would go home. See? But David said, no, I'll fight him. And you remember, King Saul came out, called him in and said, well, if you're going to go fight him, you at least ought to wear my armor. Man, when David got the armor on, he couldn't even move, you know. So he said, I can't wear this took the armor off, and he heads out to fight Goliath with his slingshot. Now, let me tell you something. David's not being presumptuous. Now, don't get that in your mind at all. Don't think he didn't know how to throw that slingshot. The Scripture says you could put a hair over there on the wall, and David could hit within the width of that hair every time. So, I mean, he didn't have any doubts about his ability to throw that slingshot. That was clear. He got down to the creek, and he picked up what? Five smooth stones. Why? I mean, he knows good and well that he'll only throw one at that giant. I mean, if he doesn't get that giant with the first stone, it's Katie bar the door. It's over. He knows that. So why pick up five smooth stones? Because the Scripture says Goliath had four brothers and they were all giants, and he picked up one for every one of them. <laughs> now, dear friends, what I'm trying to get across is that was what happens when you spend time in the Word. I mean, you've got to spend some time in it. That helps you understand what the Lord's talking about. It gives spiritual discernment. It happens to be the way that we commune with God. Take some time to study it. Spend some time in the Word of God. Also, another way that we know God's will for our life is by prayer. You've got to take time to pray. Any one thing today that is lacking in the churches, it's prayer. 
People don't spend enough time praying. If you want to know God's will for your life, you're going to have to spend some time on your knees. I want you to listen. The early church, they're all together. This is what it says happened. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the what? The Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. It says that they're meeting together, they're fasting and they're praying, and as they're praying, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, listen, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work that I want them to do. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid hands on them and sent them away. That happens to be one of the ways that you know God's will for your life is by prayer. Haven't you ever been in a place where you didn't know what you should do? You, you just didn't have a clear signal on it. It just wasn't clear, and so you begin praying about it. And as you pray about it, the conviction gets stronger and stronger and stronger until you don't have any doubts as to what God wants you to do. That's how God answers your prayer, folks. That's what happens. You see, it's by prayer that he brings conviction to our hearts, helps me know exactly what God wants me to do. Spend time in prayer. Now, if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're spending time in the book, and you're spending time in prayer, and you're not clear what God wants you to do, then look for providential circumstances. Watch for them. The Lord will show you. Now, I want to get something real clear here tonight because I find some Christian people that don't understand this, and I want you to understand it. You see, if it is right, I don't have to ask any questions about that, do I? I mean, if it's right, I know what the Lord wants me to do. I, I don't understand these Christian people. Study God's Word with them sometimes, and they'll say to me, Brother Cox, I understand that's what the Scripture says. I can see that. I'll tell you what, I'll pray about it, and if that's what the Lord wants me to do, what in the world are they saying? You better believe if it's right and the Lord says to do it, do it. None of this stuff saying, I'll pray about it. If it's right, it's right. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Boy, I tell you, I, it, I talk to some people and they say to me, well, Brother Cox, I don't see what's wrong with that. I, I just don't see anything wrong with that at all. And you know what I want to say to them? Bless your heart, you can't see. You're blind. That's what's wrong. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't have to play tootsies with that. If it's wrong, it's wrong. Just settle it right there. Oh, I'm not saying the devil might not tempt you. I'm not saying that that might be, not be a problem with you. But if it's wrong, surrender it and pray and ask God to supply you with the need that you need with the help you need. If it's wrong, it's wrong. The area that you and I need to look for providential circumstances is when I don't know. It's not right, it's not wrong, I just don't know what I ought to do. Then I need to look for it. I need to see what God's will is. I need to seek the Lord. Let me try to help you understand what I mean. Abraham, as you know, had a son by the name of Isaac. When Sarah died, Isaac evidently was very, very close to his mother because he mourned her death for months. In fact, he mourned it so long that it worried his father, Abraham. And finally, Abraham went to his old servant, Eliezer, and he said, listen, we got to find a wife for Isaac. Uh, we got to find a wife. And he said, I don't want him marrying any of these Canaanite women said, what I want you to do, Eliezer, I want you to go back to where I was raised, my hometown, and I want you to find a son, a wife for Isaac. How would you like to have a job like that? Boy, not on your life. Every time they had a fight, you know who they'd blame? <laughs> Never. 
wouldn't want that. And Eliezer didn't either. Boy, he made every excuse you could think of to get out of it, and Abraham wouldn't let him out of it. And he finally said, what if I get down there and they, she won't even come back with me? And Abraham said, well, you're released if she won't come back. Abraham gets a caravan of camels, and he loads that whole caravan, I mean, with all kinds of gifts. I mean, he just lines it up. Tells Eliezer, go find him a wife. Now, this old servant, he's not dumb. He knows what he's doing. And he gets down to the land of Abraham's kinfolks. And as he approaches the city, he stops that caravan out there, and he goes over and prays. And he said, the God of my master Abraham... I don't know how to go out. I don't know how to come in. I don't know who ought to be Isaac's wife. So, Lord, I'm going to go down to the well. And if you have a wife for Isaac, have her offer to come out and water my camels. So he goes down there. And a little bit, out comes Rebecca. And she gives him a drink and says, can I water your camels? And Eliezer talks to her. She takes him home, finds out that this is part of Abraham's family. He tells him what it's all about. And she decides to go back and become Isaac's wife. You see, I'm talking about providential circumstances watching for them. If I will watch for them, God will show you exactly what his will is for your life. You see, I need to pray. I need to spend time on my knees and say, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, then open the doors. Now, let me tell you a little bit about opening the doors. God only opens one door at a time. Only one door at a time. And when by faith you walk through that one door, he'll open up another one. And there may be some times that he'll open up a door and you'll step in and he'll slam it behind you and he won't close the one in front of you very quickly. Or he won't open the one in front of you very quickly. You're just going to have to wait sometimes. But as he opens doors... Step through it. I run on to people all the time that they want God to open all the doors, clear down the corridor, and they want to look all the way down and say, yeah, it looks all right, Lord. No. That isn't the way God does it. He opens one door at a time, and as he opens it, walk through it. Now, folks, it is just as much God's will for you to pray and say, Lord, if you don't want me to do this, close the door. That's just as much God's will. Say, if this isn't what you want me to do, close it. Run on to Christian people that say, Lord, if this isn't what you want me to do, please close the door. And the Lord slams the door, and they stand there and butt their head against it. <laughs> now, if he shuts the door, accept it. That isn't what he wants you to do. He'll open another door. But you just need to accept it. This is the way God shows us what his will is. I think most of you remember Moses. Raised in Egypt. Actually, really to be the next Pharaoh. But at the age of 40, he had to flee had to flee out into the wilderness of Midian. And there he became a shepherd, and he now takes care of the sheep for 40 years. As he comes to the end of this 40 years, he sees this bush burning. It's not being consumed. And he goes over and takes a look at it, and the voice speaks to him and said, Moses, take off your shoes. The ground you're standing on is holy. He takes off his shoes. 
And the Lord said, Moses, I want you to go down to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses has been to Egypt. He knows all about Egypt. In fact, he's tried to forget it for 40 years. And Moses said, well, Lord, that's fine, but I've been out in the wilderness here for 40 years, and I can't talk very well. Uh, you know, just an excuse. That's all it was. Because the Lord had an answer for that. He said, well, said that's okay, Moses. We'll let your brother Aaron talk for you. Did you ever hear of Moses letting Aaron talk? Yeah. You see, he just, he just didn't want to go to Egypt. And he said, Lord, listen, how do I know you'll be with me? The Lord said, that rod you got in your hand, throw it down. Threw the rod down and it became a snake, serpent. And the scripture says that Moses, what? He fled. You know why he fled? Because it was poisonous. I mean, he wouldn't have been running off if it wasn't... He was very familiar with snakes. He wouldn't have been running off if it wasn't poisonous. Said he fled, and the Lord said, Hey, Moses, come back here. And Moses gets back, and you know what the Lord tells him to do? Said, take it by the tail. You don't take poisonous snakes by the tail, folks. That's the last place you want to get hold of is the tail. I mean, you don't get poisonous snakes there. He said, take it by the tail, Moses. And Moses took it by the tail and it became a rod. And Moses went down to Egypt and after ten plagues, finally, as the angel passed over and all the firstborn were slain, the Pharaoh let the people go. And they get across the Red Sea and they're out in the wilderness and they come to Mount Sinai and God calls Moses up there on the top of Mount Sinai and he gives them the Ten Commandments and he tells them all that he's going to do for them and he sets them out for the land of Canaan. And in a few weeks there at the land of Canaan, and they say, we're not going over there, there's giants. And in spite of all that Joshua and Caleb had to say, they couldn't convince them and the children of Israel turn and they go back in the wilderness and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. A million and a half of them. And Moses cares for these people, looks after them, guides them, directs them, carries them in his, on his back, does everything and at the end of 40 years, they're now approaching the borders of the land of Canaan again. And God says, Moses, come on up here on the top of Mount Nebo. Come by yourself, Moses. And Moses goes up there on the top of Mount Nebo. And God said, Moses, I want to show you the land of Canaan. He stands there and he shows him out across that immense valley, the Jordan River. And you can look out there, the whole valley is, it stretches out. And he says, all this I'm going to give to the children of Israel, Moses. But you're not going in, Moses. Not going in? I mean, this man has spent 40 years of his life guiding, directing these people. This is his fondest desire. Not go in? No, Moses, you're not going in. You're going to lay down here by yourself and die. Lay down here and die? Not once. Now listen carefully. Not one word of disagreement do you hear on the part of Moses. You don't have, hear him saying, Why, Lord? You don't hear him saying, Lord, listen, I've worked for 40 years to get over in the land of Canaan. You don't hear him arguing with the Lord. You don't hear him disagreeing. You don't hear him saying anything except, okay. And he lays down there and dies. And the angels bury him. And you say, unfair. 
not right. How could it be that this man would spend all of his life working and trying to get the children of Israel into the land of Canaan and God would deny him that opportunity? Let me tell you something, dear friend. God had something much better in mind because it says in the book of Jude that God sent his angels and resurrected Moses and took him to heaven. I said, no, Moses. You see, if you're down there in the earthly Canaan, I can't spend as much time with you as I'd like to. Come on up here, Moses. Come up to the heavenly Canaan. Oh, dear friend, let me tell you, God's will for you is pleasant. It's good. It's happy. It's joy. It's peace. In fact, he just simply says, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. He'll do that for you. If you and I are just willing to take our lives and place them in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ, you just got to turn it all over to Jesus and let him have his way with your life. Listen as Sylvia sings. Our subject tomorrow night is Beauty and the Beast. We're going to be studying Revelation, the 12th chapter. In the 12th chapter of Revelation are three characters. There is a woman, a very beautiful woman. We're going to identify this woman, prophecy, find out who she represents. It says there is a great red dragon. We're going to identify the great red dragon, find out who it represents. And it says that this woman is pregnant, about to give birth to a male child. We're going to identify who the male child is. We're going to take a look at this prophecy of Revelation 12 that is an extremely important one. And so we hope that each of you can be back with us tomorrow night as we study beauty and the beast. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, this evening, we're so thankful that we can just take our will and place it in your hands, our lives, to know that in everything you love us, you care for us, you desire that which is good, and that we can rest safely, completely, because we know that we're accepted. We know that in your eyes we're significant. Bless each one here as they accept thee as their Savior. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good night. God bless each one of you.